Uh, my name is Cameron Hewitt, uh, and I work here at Rick Steves Europe. Um, I'm actually the co-author of Rick's guidebook on Croatia and Slovenia. I also work on our Eastern Europe book, uh, and I also write and research other guidebook and other materials for Rick as well. And I'm really excited today to be able to tell you about uh, two of my favorite countries, and I think two of the most beautiful countries in Europe, uh, and that's Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, first, I wanted to wish you all a welcome. Thank you very much for coming. We're really glad to have you here. And welcome also to the folks who are watching at home, either live streaming or on our website. Uh, these videos are, are going to be on our website, available for anyone to watch anytime uh, in the near future. Um, let's go ahead and get started exploring these wonderful countries of Croatia and Slovenia. I just wanted to give you a taste of some of the things we're going to see here. This is a great place to just dive on in to the Adriatic, whether you're swimming in the sea in front of a romantic old town on the coast, maybe you're taking a dip at the base of a thundering waterfall, or maybe you're taking a dip in a pristine alpine lake. As I mentioned, this is, I think, one of the most beautiful corners in all of Europe. Uh, but there's more than just the natural wonders. You've got uh, vineyards, you've got charming hill towns, you've got some really dramatic coastal villages and towns, small towns, big cities, uh, thriving cities. It's just a really exciting place to explore and enjoy. You have a lot of offbeat sites as well here in Croatia and Slovenia. Um, you've got, for example, Predjama Castle in Slovenia. This is a castle burrowed into the side of a cliff. It's also a chance to get a sense of the exotic diversity of cultures uh, throughout this part of Europe. Um, you're very close to Bosnia. The title of this class is Croatia and Slovenia, but I'm also going to be talking about Bosnia and Montenegro, two countries that were once part of the same country as Croatia and Slovenia, uh, but now have a very different, very uh, unique culture that you can go and visit. But again, I always come back to those natural wonders. This is really one of the most beautiful parts of Europe. You've got, for example, the gorgeous waterfalls of Plitvice Lakes National Park. You've got the soaring peaks of the Julian Alps up in the northwest part of Slovenia. You can take a tranquil boat ride across a, cut glass, uh, across a glassy lake uh, under the shadows of cut glass peaks to an island in the middle of Lake Bled. It's just a really romantic and beautiful place to travel. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Croatia and Slovenia, Slovenia generally. These are two of the seven countries that emerged from what was once one country, Yugoslavia. Uh, I'll give you a very quick uh, description of Yugoslavia a little bit later. Um, you've got Croatia, which I'll cover first. You'll notice that Croatia wraps almost all the way around Bosnia, Herzegovina. So I'll also talk about a couple of little stops you might want to make there in Bosnia. And just south of Croatia is a different country, Montenegro, another good side trip. Then we're going to head up at the end and talk about Slovenia up in the north uh, part of the country. Now, while these used to be all part of the same country, it's really striking how different they are when you go there. Um, you realize that Yugoslavia uh, was pretty short-lived, and it was always kind of an artificial union, and you really are aware of that when you're traveling across borders. You just really feel like you're in a different place. Uh, taken together, I think this is a, a great region to travel in. Uh, by the way, I will admit to you up front that I like to use uh, Croatia as kind of a Trojan horse for getting people to go to Slovenia. Um, that's why it gets equal billing with this class. I, I love Croatia. It's a wonderful place. Uh, but Slovenia, I think, is one of the most underrated gens in Europe. So I uh, hope you look forward to, to seeing that. And even if you weren't thinking that you'd go to Slovenia, maybe after this talk, it'll change your mind. But let's start off in the main attraction for most folks, and that is Croatia. Croatia is a sort of a boomerang-shaped country, about 5 million people, and it ended up with most of the coastline of the former Yugoslavia. So a lot of what you're going to see and do in Croatia is coastal. It's little islands, um, it's uh, coastal towns and villages, swimming, beach time, that sort of thing. Uh, but there's also some great stuff in the interior. We're actually going to start up in the north. It's a wedge-shaped peninsula called Istria. We're going to work our way south, but we are going to head into that interior part of the country, the capital city of Zagreb up at the top there. Right in the middle there, we'll also go through Plitvica Lakes National Park, one of the, I think, great natural wonders in all of Europe. We're going to start up in Istria, and uh, the most appealing town in Istria, and uh, Rick and I agree, this is also the most appealing coastal town all along the Adriatic between Venice and Dubrovnik, and that is the town of Rovin. Uh, Rovin is simply a delightful little town. It looks like it's being pulled up to heaven uh, by its grand oversized bell tower. Um, there's not a lot to see or do, per se, in Rovin. It's just a very romantic, relaxing place to, to go for a stroll, uh, enjoy maybe a photo safari. I like to walk through the streets of Rovin with, with my camera cocked. You get a nice picture of a uh, fisherman mending his nets, for example. Uh, people drying their laundry on the street as if they're flying their flag. And you never know who's watching you when you're watching the great sights of uh, Rovin. Uh, 
Um, I think uh, one of the things that people really like about Rovin, uh, it's sort of the most Italian feeling part of Croatia. Historically, this corner of Croatia was, was part of Italy. Really, all of Croatia was, was part of Italy for a lot of its history, at least the coastline was. Um, but this part was part of Italy for a little bit longer than the rest. So, for example, Rovin is actually bilingual. Uh, all the signs are in both Italian and Croatian, and it does have that kind of Italian feel. Uh, a lot of great opportunities to experience the local culture uh, here in Rovin and really throughout Croatia, but always make sure you're aware of if there are any kind of uh, uh, folk shows or uh, uh, this sort of thing going on. Uh, each of these towns has its own very proud local culture and costumes, local dances, um, so make sure that you're aware of those and don't miss them. Uh, Croatia is just a wonderful place to be on vacation. It's, it sort of comes up with uh, all sorts of innovative ways to relax and have fun and have a memorable experience. Rovin, for example, is one of many places that has a really cool bar. Uh, this is called Valentino Cocktail Bar. Uh, you can go there for uh, a chance to watch the sunset with a drink on the rocks. Literally, you're sitting on the rocks, uh, on the ocean. They'll give you a cushion. Uh, that you can sit on while you sip your cocktail and watch the, the sun dip slowly in the Adriatic. Um, this is the kind of thing you get to do all along the Croatian coastline, uh, but Rovin is one of my favorite towns, and, and this is a really cool experience. Rovin is also a great home base for exploring this region of Istria that I just mentioned. Uh, it's actually a very diverse region, even though it's quite small. If you drive an hour south from Rovin, you go to the big city of Pula, which has uh, one of the best preserved ancient Roman amphitheaters anywhere in Europe. Uh, you can tour that. It's kind of like a mini Colosseum. It's amazing uh, when I take, uh, as a tour guide, when I take uh, uh, folks to this place, um, they kind of look around and say, I can't believe I've never heard of this before. This is an incredible amphitheater. Uh, like a lot of things in this part of Europe, this is a little bit off the beaten track. Uh, the whole town of Pula, by the way, is just loaded with these Roman ruins. This is a uh, Roman temple that's just sitting right there on the main square of Pula. Uh, the other thing I really like about this region of Istria, it's got some of the best uh, and most appealing reasons to head inland. Uh, in the form of some really delightful uh, hill towns, just like the hill towns you'd find in Tuscany or Provence. Um, these, this region in general is not quite as uh, spiffed up as that is, uh, but you know what? It's, it's a great day to just kind of drive around, um, check out these hill towns, get lost in a place that that's sort of feels lost in time. Uh, by the way, like I said, this used to be part of Italy. You have a lot of abandoned hill towns here because they used to be Italian towns. Uh, after this part of Croatia became Croatia instead of Italy, a lot of Italian families fled to Italy proper. So you have a lot of these kind of abandoned hill towns that were like later colonized uh, by artists and vacationers and this sort of thing. So you're having a, an experience right now in Istria of uh, delightful hill towns that are just sort of uh, being rediscovered and establishing themselves as, as great destinations. My favorite hill town in Istria is one called Motovun. Uh, this is also a town that gets the Rick Steves seal of approval. Uh, what do I like about uh, Motovun? It's very well located right in the middle of Istria. Uh, it's got a extremely beautiful and tranquil main square. It's a little tiny town. You can walk from one end to the other in just a couple of minutes. And from Motovun, you have a really wonderful views over the Istrian countryside. It's a great place to do a little bit of a wine tasting. We like to take our, our tours on a wine tasting experience here. Um, speaking of wine, I'll talk a little bit about the food um, and drink that you'll enjoy throughout Croatia and Slovenia. Um, Let's start with the drink. Croatia actually has some really uh, very high quality wines. And uh, what happened, not just in Croatia, but really throughout Eastern Europe, throughout the communist countries of Eastern Europe, under communism, a lot of uh, wineries became collectivized, um, and the quality went really downhill. That was just sort of the communist system for producing wines. Since the end of communism, a lot of folks are coming back, uh, going back to their roots, literally. Uh, people are buying back their, their families' ancestral wineries, or people are importing know-how from other winemaking regions. Uh, and in the last five or 10 years, Croatian wines are really gaining some esteem, some well-deserved esteem. Uh, they're showing up on, on wine lists in fancy restaurants in, in Rome and London and Paris. Um, and actually, for the first time, I just was in, uh, in Croatia updating my book a few months ago. For the first time, um, I'm noticing there's starting to be a culture of wine tasting as well. Uh, it used to be a little tricky. You'd have to call ahead and, and make an appointment. But more and more, you've got this sort of Napa Valley-style situation where there's a gorgeous winery perched on a hill overlooking the vineyards, and you can just drive up anytime you want and, and taste a couple of uh, a different uh, vintages from their, their vines. It's really fun. Uh, if you are a teetotaler, um, or even if you're not, you should try the local answer to Coca-Cola. Uh, it's called Kokta. Uh, and this is kind of a funny story, and you will see this everywhere. It sounds obscure, but you'll see it everywhere in both Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, this originated during communist times when you couldn't get real Coca-Cola. So the communist authorities came up with uh, their kind of ersatz alternative called Kokta Kokta. Pretty subtle marketing there. 
Um, it's worth trying once. Um, it certainly has its fans. It kind of tastes like Coke that's gone bad. And um, what's interesting about Coke is people my age grew up drinking Coke, and so they have a lot of uh, sort of sentimentality attached to it. Uh, so people still drink it because that's what they're used to. Um, I like to tease it, but actually it's kind of fun to go to a place that you can buy Coke, of course, but it's interesting to have a local alternative that they're very proud of. Uh, talking about the food, well, here in Istria specifically, and this really applies only to Istria, uh, you've got some of the best truffles that you're going to find anywhere in Europe. Uh, Istria rivals uh, some of the other famous uh, truffle growing regions in, in for example, uh, Italy and, and France. Um, so a lot of menus in Istria have truffle specialties. I really try to uh, enjoy that as much as possible when I'm there. Once you leave Istria, it's not so much. Uh, Croatian food in general, it's, it's kind of interesting. I would say it resembles Italian food, but it's, it's not maybe quite as good as Italian food. I hate to say it. I love Croatia, uh, and I enjoy traveling there. Uh, the Croatian tourist board is trying to market Croatia as a, as a culinary destination, and I'm not sure that that's the best move because it inflates expectations. Um, I would say Croatians eat to live rather than live to eat. But you will find no shortage of good things to eat while you're there. It's, again, very what you would think of Italian-style food. You've got a lot of kind of dry cheeses and uh, prosciutto. They call it prosciutto, uh, the, the local version. Um, the kind of budget standby for food would be a pizzeria or a pasta restaurant. Um, so if you want to just kind of grab a meal on the go, you're going to find pizzerias and pasta places on every corner throughout Croatia. Uh, if you want to do something a little more special and uh, a little bit more local, maybe, there's a lot of great seafood options, fish restaurants. Beware, though, that a lot of times uh, on menus, fish is priced by the either the kilogram or by the 100-gram unit rather than by the portion. Um, so if the price for your fish seems suspiciously low, you can ask the waiter, and it may be that it's per 100 grams and a real portion is four or 500 grams, uh, which means you have to multiply that price. And you know what? Don't be afraid to try local, uh, local surprises, things that you wouldn't normally try at home. You might find a, it's a new favorite dish. This is one of my local favorites in Croatia. It's an octopus salad. First time I had it, I was very skeptical, but it's actually quite delicious. It, they use uh, chopped onion and tomato and capers, and they spritz it with, with lemon, and it's a really delicious way to taste some uh, local flavors. Um, there's also a big influence from the Bosnian part of the former Yugoslavia, which means kind of Turkish-style food. That means grilled meats. Um, so when Slovenians and Croatians have a backyard barbecue, they don't have hamburger and bratwurst. They have cevapcici and raznici and these kind of uh, minced meat patties and, and links. Uh, and that's sort of the good kind of alternative to fish and pasta if you need a break. Um, you can have a mixed grill where you get to try a lot of these grilled meats. Uh, of course, in our guidebooks and on our tours, we always look for really local-style places. This is one of my favorite places. It's in Istria. Uh, it's Alma is the woman we're seeing here. She's the, the wife of the owner and chef. She does a lot of the cooking right there on an open fireplace in the middle of the restaurant. Um, it's really authentic. It's really delicious. Um, there's a lot of uh, great food to be had here. As you can imagine, anywhere in Europe, especially in Croatia, which is, tends to be pretty resorty and touristy, uh, you don't want to go necessarily to the restaurant that's right there on the main drag with the big obvious tables. Uh, you're going to probably find lower prices, better quality food, and better service if you duck down some back lanes. Uh, in my guidebook, I've, I've gone to great pains to find some really good choices in each town. And a lot of times, they can literally be just a two-minute walk around the corner down a quiet back lane from the big fancy place on the main square that costs a lot more. Um, so just be sure to sniff out some good choices there. We're going to head into the interior, and that means the capital city of Zagreb. Um, I think Zagreb might be the most underrated destination in Croatia. It's a really wonderful city. When you think of Croatia, you might think of islands. Um, you might think of the coastline. But actually, uh, Zagreb is a really good excuse to head into the interior. Uh, it's a big, bustling city. Uh, it's the home of basically one out of every five Croatians. Uh, and it gives you a nice kind of urban contrast to the romantic kind of time past coastline. Uh, there's also some really fun and interesting and offbeat sightseeing in Zagreb. Uh, right in the core of town, up on the hill there, is the old town. If you take a funicular up, you're on this beautiful square called St. Mark's Square with this beautiful uh, uh, mosaic roof church. And just a few steps from that church are, are two of my favorite museums in this part of Europe. And both of them are quite offbeat, quite unusual, and really worth seeking out. One of them is called the Museum of Naive Art. Not native art, but naive art. This originated in the early 20th century. It's a, it's a specifically Croatian school of art. Uh, it's based on the idea that art world insiders wanted to demonstrate that art talent is an inborn 
a skill. It's not something that can be taught. So they would go to little poor villages and find artists who had no formal training and elevate them as artists. And there's this fantastic little gallery of paintings by these uh, self-taught peasant artists. Um, again, just right here on the main square. And then there's another very different museum that's just across the street. This is the Museum of Broken Relationships. And it kind of shows the irreverent modern urban spirit of Croatia. Basically, someone had the idea of finding an object that symbolized the end of a relationship. And then they had the participants of the relationship write a little description of why this is important to their relationship. Uh, so you walk through a few rooms and you can find out why this smashed garden gnome, for example, uh, encapsulated a bad relationship, a relationship gone bad. It's really a, a fun, creative approach. This has actually gotten a lot of international attention. It was in the New York Times. Um, they've taken their show on the road. Um, it really shows kind of a, the Croatian creative spirit. Uh, for a big city, Zagreb is also very people friendly, very relaxing. There's a wonderful green belt of parks where you can go and sit out and enjoy, do some people watching. It's also got some of the most uh, lively, kind of fun urban uh, cafe culture that you're going to find in Croatia. Uh, there's a couple of streets, pedestrian only streets, right in the downtown, where you can just sit out and nurse a coffee for a couple hours and just feel like you're surrounded by life. Um, really good restaurants here in Zagreb as well. Um, every time I go, I'm impressed by how much, uh, how much nicer and better and, and more exciting it's getting. It's, it's a city that's really being revitalized. A couple hours south of Zagreb is, um, I think, one of the most surprising and most spectacular natural wonders anywhere in Europe. Um, this is a place that, if you're going on a tour, for example, that goes here, you'll say, I've never heard of that place. Well, I guarantee you, after you leave, you'll never forget it. It's called Plitvica Lakes National Park. Plitvica Lakes National Park is basically a Grand Canyon um, that basically uh, consists of 16 terraced lakes scattered around this canyon. The lakes are all connected by these spectacular waterfalls. And the entire thing is linked up by an ingenious network of boardwalks and paths that take you across the lakes, literally close enough to feel the spray. As you're walking through Plitvica, first you hear the waterfalls, then you see the waterfalls, and then you feel the waterfalls. It's an absolutely amazing place. Um, some cases, the boardwalks literally take you right up the middle of a rushing waterfall. One nice thing about Plitvica is it's extremely well coordinated. It's well set up. You can see the best parts of the park in just two or three hours. Um, there's no need to spend several days here. Uh, that means it's also a little bit crowded. There's a lot of tour groups that come through, um, but it's really worth any hassle that you go to. It's a little tricky to get to. It's, a, again, about two and a half hours south of Zagreb. If you have a car, it's perfect. You can also get there by bus. It's a little bit trickier, but that's all described in the guidebook. Oh, and did I mention the water at Plitvica? between all of those amazing waterfalls is absolutely crystal clear. Um, this is one of those places where it's amazing, after you've been there, it's just amazing that you've never heard it. Rick likes to say that for many years, he traveled around Europe when he was younger and he thought he'd seen it all. And then he went to Plitvica and was proven wrong. It's, it's a remarkable place. Um, right near Plitvica is the part of the country, one of the parts of the country that was the most severely damaged in the war that took place between 1991 and 95. Um, I haven't really talked about this much. I'm going to get a little bit uh, later into some of the details of that war, the causes and effects. Um, the first thing I want to say is it's very safe to travel in Croatia. Um, the war is long in the past. It's very safe, very stable. There's no danger or threat whatsoever to, to travelers there. Um, but there are a few little areas, and the countryside near Plitvica, deep in the interior, is one of them, where you are going to see buildings and houses that were bombed out. You might see memorials uh, to people who were lost in the fighting. Uh, it's a very complicated, very wrenching situation. Basically, uh, this part of Croatia was very much mixed between Croats and Serbs when Croatia declared its independence. Uh, the Serbs who were living in this part of Croatia forced out the Croats. First, there was a wave in that direction. They kind of held it tensely for a few years, and then later the Croats came back and pushed the Serbs back out. So you had two waves of de uh, devastation, two waves of warfare, two waves of fighting. Um, as sobering as this is, uh, it's just it's one more important component of a, a trip to Croatia and Slovenia, particularly Croatia. Um, this is a very complicated region. You've got delightful beach towns, you've got natural wonders, and you've got this really heavy, weighty recent history. I think that's one of the reasons why this is such an exciting place to travel. And even though it might look a little bit startling to see the bullet holes in this building, one thing I take away when I visit a town like this, this is a town called Otochats. Uh, if you pan down from this, you'll see that there's a lively little produce stand that's moved back into the ground floor. It's inspiring to see people putting their lives and their towns back together uh, after so much hardship.
We're going to head south now, uh, down to the Dalmatian coast. The Dalmatian coast is about the southern third of the Croatian coastline. And for most folks, this is kind of the main appeal of Croatia. This is the place that they think of when they think of Croatia. Um, we're going to focus on the stretch between the big city of Split, which is here near the left side of your map, and Dubrovnik, which is here near the right side of your map. Those two big cities kind of book in the Dalmatian coast, and then there's some great islands in between. Uh, Split. I think uh, Dubrovnik kind of is the, the glamour girl, the cover girl of Croatia, but Split is a really interesting counterpoint to Dubrovnik and really well worth considering. Uh, for one thing, Split is a big urban city. This is the second biggest city in Croatia. Um, it's got a lot of sprawl. It's got a lot of kind of concrete industrial stuff on the outskirts. Uh, so it feels like a real world antidote to all of the cutesy and quite touristy little island villages that you're gonna see elsewhere in Croatia. Uh, it really feels like a vital city of today. Even though it's surrounded by all that sprawl, the city center where you'll spend most of your time is very romantic, very appealing, and very visually uh, charming. There's a wonderful promenade that runs right along the top of the harbor and split called the Riva. And they've just recently renovated and restored this whole thing. So all day people are sitting out, people watching, uh, enjoying watching the ships come and go in the distance. After dark, this becomes the promenade zone uh, for the city of Split. Croatia is a Mediterranean culture, like Italy or Spain. In Spain, they have the paseo. In Italy, they have the passeggiata. In Croatia, they have the exact same thing. Every evening as the sun goes down, people take their families and go wandering aimlessly up and down the streets, licking an ice cream cone, greeting their neighbors. Um, it's a very Mediterranean scene. And uh, Split is the best place, I think, in Croatia to find that. Because it's a big city, it has tourism, but there's a lot of local people that keep it very vital. Uh, from a historical and a sightseeing perspective, uh, Split is fascinating in terms of the Roman ruins that you can see there. I already showed you the amphitheater in Pula. This is the other place in Croatia that has the great Roman ruins. Uh, the old town of Croatia is the retirement palace, uh, the former retirement palace, of a Roman emperor. Now, I didn't say that the palace is in the old town of Split. Literally, the old town is the palace. Uh, what happened was, uh, back in the 4th century, the Roman emperor Diocletian uh, had come from this part of Croatia. He rose through the ranks, became emperor. When it was time for him to retire, he came back to his native Split and built a big, sprawling, gigantic palace right on the sea. Over the centuries after Rome fell, that palace kind of fell into disrepair, and locals started to move in, and they turned the hallways of the palace into the streets of Split. And they turned, for example, the uh, main hallway that we're seeing right here into the main square of Split. Uh, it's a really amazing uh, opportunity to see people living within and among actual Roman ruins on an everyday basis. This is that Roman Emperor Diocletian who built this palace. He was notorious, among other things, for torturing Christians. Um, and there's this wonderful kind of uh, poetic justice. This blocky building we see here was the mausoleum of the Roman, em uh, Roman Emperor Diocletian. Uh, centuries after his death, it was turned into the cathedral, the Catholic cathedral of town. And there's this kind of victorious bell tower that's been added onto one side. And that's really the story, not just of Split, but all of Croatia. There's this fascinating layering of history. If you're interested in that, there's a lot of that to be seen here. You can also go into the cellars underground. It's kind of like a modern daylight basement. They had to level out the foundation in order to build this palace. It was forgotten for many centuries, and finally in the 20th century they excavated this. They realized that there were these amazing Roman cellars that you can now walk through and tour underneath the entire old town of Split. Uh, when I'm traveling as a tour guide and also in my guidebooks, I like to introduce uh, Americans to artists that they have probably never heard of, or very likely haven't. Um, and just through the fluke of the fact that Ivan Mestrovich was born in Croatia instead of France, he's probably not on your radar, even if you're uh, something of an art historian. But Ivan Mestrovich is one of the, the great, talented Croatian artists. Obviously, he's a sculptor. He worked in the early 20th century. Uh, he was a contemporary of Rodin, uh, the French sculptor. In fact, Rodin was a great admirer of Ivan Mestrovich. He considered him a peer. Um, Ivan Mestrovich has giant monuments and statues all over Croatia. Uh, during the, the heydays of Yugoslavia, for example, he had a lot of commissions to build a lot of things. Um, this is a self-portrait of Ivan Mestrovich. And like Diocletian before him, Ivan Mestrovich retired to uh, the area of Split. This is just on the outside of the downtown of Split, and built a giant retirement palace. Uh, and it's now been turned into a museum and a gallery of his works. So if you'd like to know a little bit more about this extremely talented Croatian sculptor, Ivan Mestrovic, uh, you can, while you're in Split, take a look.
and enjoy uh, this, this uh, very underrated talent. If you have heard of Ivan Mestrovich, you're probably from Chicago, and that's because there are two giant Native American statues in Grant Park in Chicago. Those are by Ivan Mestrovich. Uh, when things got a little bit dicey during the war, he actually ended up living in exile in the United States, where he was very prolific here as well. I want to talk a little bit about accommodations, and this bears a little uh, explanation because the situation for uh, sleeps in Croatia is quite different from a lot of other places. Uh, this is a hotel I really like in Split. It's called Villa Ana. It's a charming little uh, stone house, five rooms, family run. It's a classic Rick Steves type accommodation. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of classic Rick Steves type accommodation in Croatia. They have a tradition here for big, giant hotels, especially during the Yugoslav period. Um, this was um, a place for mass tourism. They would big build big, giant, 200-room resort hotels with big conference rooms, and uh, they're really designed for people coming uh, on an excursion from England, for example, or Germany, and spending two weeks. Not really a Rick Steve-style accommodation. And uh, worst, a lot of these big, uh, giant hotels have been renovated, but have been renovated to four or five-star class, which means they're very expensive, two or three hundred dollars a night. And they also tend to be kind of on the outskirts of town. They're not right in the heart of the old town. They're a 15-minute bus ride away. This is Dubrovnik, for example. From here, you have to take a 15-minute bus trip to get into the city center. Uh, there is salvation, though, and it's the, in the form of the word sobe. Sobe is simply the Croatian word for rooms. Uh, you'll see sobe and apartments, or apartmani, advertised all over Croatia. These are basically our entrepreneurs who are renting out rooms in their house, um, a little bit like British bed and breakfasts, except that they usually don't include the breakfast. Um, it's a great way not only to save money, a really nice hotel-esque sobe, where you have your own bathroom and you have air conditioning and satellite TV, might cost more like uh, 80, 90, 100, 110 dollars, as opposed to two or three or 400 dollars, like the big hotels. Um, and the nice thing about Sobe is it really connects you with local people. Uh, these are a couple of my favorite Sobe hosts who live in the city of Dubrovnik, uh, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Uh, coincidentally, they're both named Pero. Uh, they've assigned themselves numbers, I think, based on my order in the guidebooks. So the tall one is Pero 1, and the, and the short one is Pero number 2. Um, wonderful guys. They're the kind of guys you wish you want to hang out with and sip coffee with all day long. Um, if you're staying at their place, they'll give you a little coupon so you can come down to a cafe that's right here on the main drag in Dubrovnik and sit out and have breakfast and have coffee. They come and hang out there too. They used to call this cafe their living room because it was the place where they would connect with friends and hang out. Uh, the last couple of years, they have a new nickname for it. They call it Facebook. They'll say, I'll see you at Facebook, and they mean the, the, this cafe that's right out here on the, uh, on the main promenade here in Dubrovnik. Um, this is another family that rents out Sobe. This is in the island of Korchula. Um, you'll never guess what this guy's name is, Pero, uh, and that's his wife, Lenny. I think just about everybody in Dubrovnik in Dalmatia is named Pero, just like everybody in Hungary is named Istvan. Uh, there are certain names that get reused that way. Anyway, Lenny and, uh, and uh, Pero also rent out rooms in their uh, wonderful stone home right in the center of the old town of Korchula for a very affordable price. Um, you might be worried about, you know, I don't really want to be staying in somebody's house. A lot of these are actually very upscale, very hotel-esque. You have a lot of privacy. You can interact with your host as much or as little as you want. If you want to just do your own thing, they're very cool with that. But if you want to hang out and get to know these folks, they're really welcome to do that as well. Uh, I spend more time in my guidebook uh, looking for great Sobe and great people renting rooms than I do anything else uh, when I do my guidebook research. So I've got dozens of wonderful folks just like these, and I've got, of course, all of their information. I've got their phone numbers, their websites, their email addresses. Um, you can book direct. I would highly recommend that. Uh, you could also search on a booking engine like Booking.com or TripAdvisor. Uh, I will caution you if you do uh, this approach. Um, if you book through Booking.com, it costs your hosts about 15%. They really prefer if you book direct. And if they're listed in my guidebook, uh, I know them really well, and I recommend, for, recommend them and, and vouch for them. Um, and haven't had, I can think of any complaints I've had with, with folks who had a reservation fall through. So you can have some confidence just emailing them directly and saying, I'd like to book a room for these two nights. Uh, it's also a great chance to have that personal connection even before your trip. Let me give you one more example of why these Sobe are a great option. This is the wonderful old town of Dubrovnik. You can see the Dubrovnik town wall here on the right side. Uh, you remember I showed you that picture of that distant bay where the big resort hotels are. That's about a 15-minute bus ride over the top of the hill that you see at the top of the screen there. Um, one of my favorite Sobe in Dubrovnik, though, is much closer. It's just outside the old town wall. This big, giant thing on the right-hand side sitting on a hill is the Hilton Hotel. 
And if you go up past the Hilton Hotel and take a left and climb a few stairs, you're going to be at the house of Yadranka Benusi. Yadranka, for a hundred bucks, will rent you a really comfortable room with a terrace that has a great view over the rooftop of Dubrovnik. Every time I'm in Croatia and updating my guidebook, I walk past the front door of that Hilton Hotel, and I can feel the air conditioning hit me in the face while the doors open and close. And I think to myself, why would you spend $500 or $400 at the Hilton when you can walk a 20 more steps up the street and go and stay in Yadranka's place for $100? Um, and she's a wonderful person, fun to sit around and chat with. I'm telling you, this is really the way to go. If you are going to Croatia, your instinct might be, let me look for hotels. Hotels are usually a dead end in Croatia. Instead, I would suggest looking for Sobe and apartments. Uh, by the way, this tip uh, applies mostly to Croatia. Slovenia actually does have some really nice hotels and pensions and, and more kind of Rick Steve style places. So that advice is very specific to Croatia. We're going to set sail. So we've seen the big city of Split, which is at one end of the Dalmatian coast. And we're going to head now to the other end of the Dalmatian coast. You know, there are so many islands uh, in Croatia. I think I, I heard somewhere there's a thousand islands uh, if you count them all together, including the uninhabited ones. Everybody has their favorite island. I promise you, anybody you know who's been to Croatia is going to tell you, you have to go to Mali Loshin. You have to go to Rab. You have to go to Kirk. Um, I'm not saying that they're wrong, but I'm not saying that they're right. In my experience, all these Croatian islands are kind of variations on the same theme. You really can't go wrong. Uh, there's no particular reason why you have to go to one over the other. Uh, but if I had to choose, if I had to pick two, and these are the ones that I put in my guidebook, uh, I'm going to pick the two that are probably the most appealing. They have the most sightseeing sort of heft. They have the most and best opportunities for relaxing, and they're also very conveniently right on the boat line. Uh, these two islands, which I'll, I'll describe now, are called Far and Korchula. These are right on the way from Split to Dubrovnik. So you can hop on a boat, um, hop off in Var, even later that same day, continue on to Korchula, and eventually work your way down to Dubrovnik. Uh, Var is the first one I'll talk about. And I say they're all kind of variations on the same theme, these islands. But each one really does have its own kind of claims to fame, its own personality. In the case of Var, it's really aggressively courting kind of the jet set uh, dollar. It's trying to become the San Tropez of Croatia. So you do see a lot of luxury yachts pulling in. Prices are quite high on Var, so just be aware of that for hotels and restaurants and accommodations in general. Uh, it's a pretty pricey place, but you get a little bit of a ritzy cachet. You get a little more happening nightlife um, for that reason. Like a lot of these coastal towns, it's got a beautiful church right on the main square. Um, in the case of Var, there's a, a fortress that's that's perched on a hill high above town. You can hike up and have really spectacular views over the town of Var, looking off to the offshore islands. You can also hire an excursion boat to take you out to one of those islands for a day of swimming. Uh, there's no shortage of ways to have fun. Uh, the thing about these little towns, by the way, is they're not about sightseeing. It's not about going to museums or churches. If there are museums, I'll mention them in my guidebook, but these are places to really take a vacation from your vacation. You're really here to relax. Another island that I'd like to highlight is Korchula. This is a really appealing island. It's kind of a mini Dubrovnik. It's got that kind of walled old town that sticks out into the sea, and you've got a dramatic mountain backdrop. It's the kind of place that makes you want to jump for joy. It's really a, a delightful town. It's a little bit more uh, lowbrow, I think, in a good way than far. It's not trying to be pretentious or be something it's not. It's just a, basically a fishing village that has a few tourists coming through every so often. Uh, and again, it's a very, a very pretty situation sticking out uh, into the Adriatic. Like, again, like every town, you've got a, a little church that's got a, a fun little uh, a treasury collection if you like to do some sightseeing. Uh, Vars, one of its claims to fame is that they do this uh, sword dance called the Moreshka. I mentioned earlier, each town kind of has its own local costumes and customs and dances. In Korchula, it's the Moreshka, uh, where the forces of good and the forces of evil do battle, and the guys dance around and, and clash their swords against each other. Uh, ultimately, the, the forces of good pre prevail and save the fair princess and so forth. They perform this one or two nights uh, every week during the summer. Um, so just be sure you're aware of those cultural opportunities. If you do want to take a nice vacation during your vacation, uh, one thing you might want to do in Croatia is go swimming. And boy, there are a few places that are more delightful to take a dip than the Adriatic. The water is absolutely crystal clear. Croatians have kind of bragged to me. They say, well, yeah, we don't have the sandy beaches like they have in Hawaii and Florida. But the problem with all that sand is it makes the water really muddy. In Croatia, it's rocky limestone that's underneath the water, which is a kind of a natural filter. So the water is just stunningly, stunningly crystal clear, uh, like nothing you've ever seen. Oops, sorry there. Um, you can go and just sort of lounge around, go for a swim. 
This fellow here is very smart. He's got wading shoes, you know, just sticking out of the water there. Um, if you are going to be swimming in Croatia, you want to get good wading shoes. It's rocky. There are sea urchins. Once you have shoes on, you're great. You're good to go. Um, but it's not a place I'd try to swim barefoot. Um, I also mentioned it's not really sandy beaches. There's a few sandy beaches. Um, but mostly it's rocky beaches, and this is how Croatians and Europeans who are on vacation in Croatia uh, like to enjoy the beach. They just find uh, a patch of rock that's as flat as possible, which often isn't very flat at all, uh, and they just spread out, get some, uh, get some rays. When they get a little too hot, they climb down a ladder, go for a nice swim, come back. Great place to be on vacation. You never know what new friend you're going to make when you're relaxing at a Croatian beach. You can also do any kind of, uh, you can imagine of the resort activities that you'd expect. You can rent uh, sea kayaks, um, you can go for boat trips, excursions to other islands. Uh, lots of great ways to have fun here. Uh, I will say, I, I would caution you as you make your itinerary, uh, don't overdo the islands. I think a lot of folks think, boy, I'm going to Croatia, I want to have good five or six days on the island. If you really want to be on vacation and relax, that's great, max out on the islands. Uh, but I think a lot of folks, uh, most Americans, I think, going to Croatia, they're not necessarily there to swim. They like to get some cultural experiences. They want to see some sights. Um, they want to uh, understand the culture. Uh, it's a little bit harder to do those in these little island towns. Um, and I would say for a lot of folks, one or two different islands, one or two days on the beach is enough, especially if that buys you a little bit extra time for some more interesting things. More interesting things, for example, going to Bosnia or going to Slovenia, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. I want to talk a little bit about the best time of year to go to Croatia. Uh, this is a very seasonal, very weather-dependent destination, uh, and your timing is important, more so, I think, than in a lot of European destinations. July and August are the major vacation time. That's when Europeans are on vacation. So Croatia is incredibly crowded during those times. Uh, and it's also hot, sometimes uncomfortably hot. Uh, and Boats are crowded and accommodations are more expensive. It's peak time. If it were totally up to me, I would actually try to avoid Croatia in July and August. If that's the only time you can do, uh, that's going to still be a great trip. My favorite time to go is in shoulder season, before and after peak season. Um, let's say from the end of May through uh, the better part of June, or from, say, the middle of September through the very, very beginning of October. Um, now, if you go too far off season, all these cute little beach towns basically shut down. In Korčula, for example, I've been there updating my guidebook in late October or in late March or early April, and half of the restaurants are still closed for the winter. These places go into hibernation. Um, so I would say there's a kind of a sweet spot. You don't want to go too far in season, too far off season. Uh, and those windows that I just mentioned, September, late May, June, are really the best things to aim for. Also, you get good weather, less crowds. Things are a little bit cheaper. Things are a little bit less stressful. In terms of connecting the dots on a Croatian vacation, uh, obviously, as you can imagine, for all these islands, boats are a great way to go. You've got boats big and small, high-speed catamarans, car ferries uh, to connect the dots. Um, over uh, beyond that, once you're on land, Croatia is really not a train culture. Croatia and Slovenia have a few trains, but it's really a place where you're going to take buses more often than trains. Uh, and bus schedules work pretty well between any two important destinations. There's at least one or two buses a day between big cities. They go every hour. Uh, there's good websites where you can find the schedules. Um, even if you're going from an island or to an island, check the bus schedules because there are buses that take the car ferries. You might be surprised. There's no boat on this day from, say, Korčula to Dubrovnik, but there's always going to be a bus that uses the car ferry. Um, so be kind of versatile in how you check your schedules. There are parts of Croatia and Slovenia that are ideal for a rental car, and there are parts where the last thing that you want is a rental car. And unfortunately, those two are kind of scattered all over the place. Um, what I find for the, <coughs> the best strategy for, for traveling here, don't do just one or the other. Don't do just public transportation or just a rental car. Use public transportation for places that it makes sense, and then rent a rental car strategically for a few days in the places where it really will help you see the things that you want to see. Uh, by the way, if you're driving in Slovenia, uh, they have a system uh, of toll stickers. Uh, in Croatia, they actually have toll booths, so you just pick up a ticket when you enter the freeway, and then you pay the ticket when you leave. In Slovenia, as soon as you cross the border, you have to buy a toll sticker that you display in the window. Uh, and if you don't know to do that, you can get pulled over and given a hefty ticket. So make sure you buy your toll sticker in Slovenia. Um, flights are also a good way to connect long distances in Croatia, and sometimes very affordably. So if you're going from Zagreb to Split, it's a five and a half hour express bus trip, but you can fly in 45 minutes. 
And uh, if you book far enough ahead on Croatia Airlines, you can often get a ticket for less than $100, and it could be worth the, the time savings for that. Now, um, I've just thrown a lot of information about sh at you about when you want a car and when you don't. Let me just talk you through a few challenges a lot of folks have when they're planning an itinerary in Croatia. Um, places that you probably don't want a rental car, well, this Dalmatian Coast area, it's, it's okay to have a rental car, but you're much more versatile if you don't have a car. You can hop on a passenger ferry, for example, instead of having to wait in a long line for a car ferry. Um, so I would say I probably don't want a car down south of Split. I do want a car for Istria to see all those hill towns up in the north. I do want a car for some of the mountain stuff in Slovenia. Uh, Plitvica, that national park, is easier to reach right in the middle there uh, if you have a car. Um, the biggest challenge is you notice some of the car places are in Croatia and some are in Slovenia. If you pick up a car in one country and drop it off in another, they usually charge a huge international drop-off fee. I mean, it can be hundreds of dollars. Some car rental companies sometimes have a deal on that, so you should check it out. Um, so you should be strategic when you think about renting your car. For example, maybe I'll pick up my car in Ljubljana, I'll use it to see Slovenia, and I'll use it to see Istria, the northern part of Croatia. You can cross the border, no problem. You just don't want to drop it off in Croatia. Then I go back up to Slovenia, drop my car off in Ljubljana, take a train to Zagreb and a bus down to Split and boats along the coast. So I've used the rental car in Croatia and Slovenia without incurring that big fee. There's about 20 different ways you can do this. I've kind of worked them all out and tried them all out myself. Uh, it requires a little bit of creativity uh, and it's a bit of a, a challenge. There's more tips in the guidebook, but just be aware that that's something that comes up. The the other thing that I've noticed is people go to this class and they come up to me afterwards and they say, hey, I've got a week and I'd love to go to Lake Blood up in the northern corner of Slovenia and Dubrovnik way down here in the southern tip of Croatia. And while I'm at it, maybe I'll stop off at Plitvica Lakes National Park right in the middle. Uh, if they only have a week, they don't realize they're going to spend an awful lot of the time on the road in buses and cars and boats to connect the dots. I would say if you have a week or less, focus either on the northern part of this area, Slovenia, Istria, maybe Zagreb, or the southern part, the Dalmatian coast, Mostar, Bosnia, Montenegro. If you have uh, 10 days or two weeks, you can really try to squeeze it all in, uh, but you're gonna spend a lot of time in transit if you try to cram too much in. If you do wanna travel on your own, of course, all of this is covered in the Rick Steves uh, Croatia Slovenia guidebook. I really enjoy working on that, updating it every year. Um, if you do want a little bit of extra help connecting the dots, we have a variety of tours that go to this region. Um, we've got our Best of the Eastern Europe tour, which is a 16-day tour. Most of it is in other countries, Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary. But we do end up with a little taste of Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, as a tour guide on this tour, I noticed that people on this tour really love that last three days and we're craving more time. So me and a couple other guides brainstormed a new tour. I say new, but we've already been doing this for many years and it's, it's one of our top sellers. This is our Best of the Adriatic tour. Whether you're going on a tour or independently, this is a great two-week plan, so I'm going to go through it very quickly. If you're doing this on your own, this is pretty much exactly how I would do it. Uh, you start off in Slovenia, Lake uh, Ljubljana, the capital city. You go up through the mountains of Lake Bled and the Julian Alps. In our tours, we spend one night in Kulbarid. Then you head down and have a couple of days in Istria. Head inland and go to the waterfalls at Plitvica Lakes for a night. Then we head on down to the Dalmatian coast. The second week of this tour is basically on the Dalmatian coast. Two nights in the big city of Split. We do a little island hopping through Hvar and Korčula. Spend two nights on Korčula. We do that little detour into Mostar for one night. And then we have our grand finale for two nights in Dubrovnik. This is a great two-week plan, again, whether by tour bus or on your own. Um, as you probably know, Rick Steves, we pride ourselves on having small groups, and I really love our tour members. We get a really great group of folks. They're fun-loving, they're easy to spend time with, and people on our tours, um, as a tour guide in this region, I really enjoy. They're very intellectual, they're smart, they're inquisitive, they want to really learn about the complicated recent history, but they also want to have fun. They want to do wine tastings, they want to have a day at the beach, and our tour, I think, is a great balance of those things and really helps people connect with, with the Europe that they came to see. Um, so consider that as a possibility if this all just seems too complicated and if you really want that extra help uh, navigating the recent history. All of this is described in much greater detail, of course, on our website, along with lots of other travel information about our books, free articles. Uh, you can watch all of Rick's TV shows for free on the website, ricksteves.com. All right, we're going to finish up our time in Croatia in what is really a suitable grand finale. This is Dubrovnik. And if I had to pick one place to send to you in Croatia, I think I'd probably send you to Dubrovnik. Um, this is a really wonderful town at the southern tip of the country. They call it the Pearl of the Adriatic for the way that it juts dramatically out into the sea. You can see it's protected by thick walls. 
You can climb up on those walls and get wonderful views over the rooftops of town. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but this is a really wonderful town. Uh, it's a it actually was an, its own little independent city-state for most of its history. When you think of, for example, Venice, the Venetian Republic, it wasn't exactly a country, but it was a city, but it had a lot of territory. Dubrovnik was actually a big rival of Venice uh, for the control of the Adriatic during a lot of this time. Um, and so there's this very distinct history that's something separate from Croatia. It's a really enjoyable place just to go for a stroll and wander. You head through the, the main gate here and up the dramatic main drag. It's, it's just a, a, one of the most enjoyable pedestrian streets anywhere here. Sitting out, enjoying a coffee, doing some people watching is one of Europe's great $5 bargains. Uh, it's really worth some time just to relax on the main drag there. Uh, lots of interesting museums and squares and landmarks. Like the little Croatian towns, this is not necessarily a place with a lot of sightseeing. There's not must-see museums. But there are some interesting little sites if you want to get in out of the sun. There's a couple of uh, monasteries that have interesting museums attached to them. Uh, you've got some really beautiful churches that you can tour. Um, there's a port that's the, uh, the old historic port right in the heart of Dubrovnik. And from here, if you want to get out of town, especially if it's getting crowded uh, with a lot of cruise passengers, you can hop on an excursion boat and it'll take you off to some secluded islands that are just offshore. Um, you can go down the port and there's uh, 20 different captains who are all trying to sell you a, a seat on a different boat excursion. From that main drag that I just showed you, Dubrovnik kind of climbs steeply in both directions up toward its wall. And that drag can be extremely crowded if there's a lot of people in town. But if you walk just literally one block, literally 10 seconds off of the main street, you can disappear into these really atmospheric tight back lanes. Um, they also have a great cable car that you can hop in from the top of the old town, and it zips you up to a spectacular viewpoint looking down on the rooftops of Dubrovnik. And from this location, you can actually see three different countries. Dubrovnik is at your feet. Bosnia is over on our left-hand side as we look at this, and those mountains off in the distance are Montenegro. Tells you a lot about the uh, sort of troubled and epic history of Dubrovnik. This is a place where a lot of cultures come together. You can understand why they were so proud of their independence for all those years. This is a great place to watch the sunset. I've already made a couple of references to the cruise ship crowds, and Dubrovnik has become an extremely popular cruise port destination. And um, I was there this year, last year, sorry, in September, I think, and I heard on the news it was the biggest cruise day in Dubrovnik's history. There were six ships in town with 20,000 people in a city of 50,000 people. Um, it can be a little stressful if you're trying to enjoy Dubrovnik and all of a sudden here's several tens of thousands of extra people kind of competing with you for the, their share of the street. Um, if you're on a cruise, you just have to kind of deal with it. If you're not on a cruise, be aware of what's coming. You can, any local person knows which ships are coming tomorrow and how many people they're bringing. There's even websites where you can check day by day what's the most crowded day. And get out of town. Go to the beach. There's some delightful beaches just outside the old town. Actually, there's beaches near and far from the old town, depending on how far you want to walk and how much peace and quiet you want. You can even go swimming right off of the old town wall and do a back float looking up at Europe's finest medieval walled city looming up in front of you. Um, so if it's crowded, there's other options outside of uh, the main part of town. My favorite activity in all of Dubrovnik is walking. It takes about an hour and a half all the way around the top of that wall. It circles the town all the way around, and you can go on a nice slow stroll and just enjoy the incredible, ever-changing scenery. You've got a sea of rooftops on one side and the actual sea on the other side. Just breathtaking. And as you walk, especially if you're a student of history, you might notice, well, the roof tiles look quite different. You've got mostly these kind of glossy new roof tiles, and then you've got some older roof tiles. And you wouldn't know the difference unless someone pointed out, well, this is a sign of that recent war that I mentioned, 1992-93. 85% um, of Dubrovnik was bombed during that war. Most of the towns on the coast were completely unaffected, but Dubrovnik was attacked. And much of the city that you see today was under siege for several months and the city was bombarded with shells from the hillsides above. Uh, one thing, again, that's really uplifting about this tragic part of recent history is just seeing how well they've recovered and put their city back together. Really an interesting place uh, to learn about that chapter of recent history. So you're walking along the top of the wall, and you look down, and you notice that clinging like a barnacle to the outside of Dubrovnik's wall is a little drink bar on the rocks, like the one we saw in Rovin, Except to get to this one, you literally have to climb through a hole in the wall to get there. And that's what the bar is called, buja. Buja means hole in the wall. 
You squeeze through that hole in the wall, and you have a beautiful place to sit and savor a drink and look out at sea and watch those cruise ships sail off into the horizon. Really, really delightful. Dubrovnik's also a great home base for day tripping. There's lots of little towns and islands and interesting sites that are an easy day trip away, and it's a great place to come home to at the end of the day. Um, I don't have a lot of time to get into detail with this, but I wanted to give you a quick orientation to the history of this region. We're about to head into some other parts of the former Yugoslavia. Um, I wish I could uh, really lavish time on this, but this is the very oversimplified, uh, as basic as possible version of this uh, Yugoslavia and how it fell apart and these wars that racked this region. Um, this part of Europe is called the Balkans. Well, the Balkans is literally the name of a peninsula. It's the peninsula that stretches between the Adriatic Sea and the Black Sea. And the former Yugoslavia was sort of the western strip of the Balkan Peninsula. Um, for much of its history, this peninsula was divided by lots of different uh, competing kind of forces. For example, the line that separated the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church ran directly through the middle of what became Yugoslavia. So people on the west side of that line are Catholics, later became known as Croats. And the people on the eastern side of that line were Orthodox, later became known as Serbs. And then you had Muslims, the Ottoman Turks, pushing up from today's Turkey and camping out in the middle of this region for hundreds of years. And a lot of people under Ottoman rule uh, converted to Islam. So you have Muslims called Bosniaks in Yugoslavia. Very complicated ethnic mix. By the way, all of these people are cousins, DNA-wise, genetically. They're all from the same gene pool. The only difference is which religion their ancestors happened to adopt. So Serbs, Croats, and Muslims, or Bosniaks, uh, the former Yugoslavia, um, they're all basically cousins. They just have different faiths. Um, this was really uh, a mess, by the way. Uh, and for most of its history, this region was part of different empires and shifting borders. Uh, finally, at the end of World War I, all of these different states kind of came together and created the first Yugoslavia. It was never successful. It was always kind of an artificial union, uh, the least of, of all evils. Let's just kind of come together and see if we can make it work. It looked like it was doomed for failure. Uh, World War II came. It rearranged the map of Europe once again. Uh, but from the ruins of World War II emerged a war hero named Josip Broz, better known by his nickname Tito. Uh, Tito, after becoming a war hero in World War II, became dictator for life of Yugoslavia. Uh, and this was the really interesting period and unique period of Yugoslav history. Uh, Yugoslavia under Tito was communist, but it wasn't Soviet communism. It never joined the Warsaw Pact. It was never officially allied with Moscow. Uh, Tito sought a system between East and West. He had diplomatic relations with both uh, Moscow and with Washington, DC. Um, he was really a brutal dictator. At the very beginning, he really uh, came down hard to get people on board. But after the first 10 or 20 years, uh, for the last few decades of Tito's rule, it was actually a time of uh, relative peace and prosperity in Yugoslavia. A lot of Yugoslavs have a lot of uh, uh, sentimentality and a lot of respect for Tito. Tito died um, in 1980. Even before he died, he knew that this was a tricky place. He tried to set up a compromise where there were six republics that were kind of semi-autonomous, a little bit like the Swiss uh, canton system, although a little more entwined than that. But sure enough, it didn't take too many years after Tito's death until the Yugoslavia post-Tito began to unravel. Uh, it was mostly because the different groups within decided that they wanted a little bit bigger piece of Yugoslavia for their own interests. Slobodan Milosevic, you see there in the, in the center of this picture, uh, the Serbian ruler in that period of Yugoslavia, uh, did some things that were very provocative to other members, Slovenes and Croats. And so these other countries declared their independence. And that's when things got pretty ugly. In Slovenia, it was pretty straightforward. They had a 10-day skirmish for their independence, and they were allowed to be free. Uh, Croatia, though, was a much more diverse country. As I mentioned earlier, you had Serbs and Croats uh, from about 1991 to 1995, there was a lot of fighting, a lot of destruction. You start to hear the term ethnic cleansing, where one group tries to remove another group from its territory, what it considers its territory. Um, Bosnia was probably the hardest hit. Not coincidentally, it was also the most diverse. You had a lot of Serbs and a lot of Croats and a huge contingent of Muslims, Bosniaks. Um, and there was a three-way war that raged for many years. Um, I won't get into all the details, but it was a really tragic chapter of the history and uh, something that's really worth reading up on and studying to understand what you're going to hear about when you're there. Um, now, at the end of uh, uh, the war in 1995, uh, a ceasefire drew the borders that more or less still exist today. There are seven countries where there once was one, Yugoslavia. We've already been to Croatia, and Slovenia is where we're headed in a few minutes, up to the north. You've also got south of that Bosnia, Montenegro, 
to the east, Serbia. Kosovo is actually now, it's also its own independent country. And then south of that uh, is Macedonia. These are the seven countries of what was Yugoslavia. There's still a lot of hard feelings. There's a long memory of, of not just the recent war, but going back centuries. Um, people are really struggling to uh, get along. What I will say is they are very welcoming. All of these groups are very welcoming to outsiders. It's actually something that's very fundamental to their culture um, throughout all of these countries. Um, what's between them is between them. Uh, it's been very peaceful. There have been no outbreaks of violence in, in 15, 20 years. Um, but you are going to hear about it, and people are often very forthcoming to tell you their opinions. And uh, if you're like me and you're interested in this stuff and find it fascinating to connect with people and hear different perspectives, it's an amazing opportunity to travel in a place where you, where you have that chance. Um, sorry to make that so quick and rudimentary. I have a long chapter, 20 pages in the back of my Croatia-Slovenia book called Understanding Yugoslavia, which I wrote to explain exactly all of this. Um, the real takeaway uh, from a traveler's perspective, safe, stable, things are very open and accessible, but it's something you'll hear about quite a bit. We're going to head to a couple of the countries that came from that breakup of Yugoslavia that are very close to Dubrovnik. And I mentioned earlier, you don't want to overdo your time on the islands. I would easily trade a day, an extra day on the islands for a day in Bosnia, for example. In two and a half hours from Dubrovnik or from Split, you can be in some really interesting places that help you experience a whole other facet of the former Yugoslavia and a whole other faith. Of course, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, more than 50% of the people are still Muslims. Um, this is where you're going to feel in just a couple hours from Dubrovnik, like you've gone all the way across the continent from Italy to Turkey. It's a really amazing diversity in a small geographical area. The easiest place to get to is Mostar. Um, this is sort of, I think of it as kind of the wading pool for Bosnia. It's, it's Bosnia with training wheels. It's very easy to get to. It gives you a taste of Bosnian culture. Uh, it also has this very famous landmark old bridge, which uh, for many years, it was built by the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, and for many years, it kind of symbolized the diversity of Mostar, uh, Muslims and Croats and Serbs living together in harmony. And then during the war, it was the symbol of the exact opposite. First, it was bombarded from the hilltop by shells. Eventually, a direct hit actually destroyed the bridge completely. And now they've rebuilt the bridge, and it's become, again, a symbol of reconciliation and uh, resurrection. And there's a great kind of, to, to, to make it a little less serious, there's a great tradition that carried on even through the war where young men like to stand on the top of the bridge and they kind of do a little show to try to get tips and once they have enough money, they'll take the plunge and they'll dive all the way down into the frigid waters of the river below. Uh, it's really a fun thing to see if you're there. It feels like a tourist trap, but they've been doing it for years. Uh, again, you're in Bosnia, you feel like you're in Turkey. You've got these mosques everywhere. You've got a shopping street that feels like a Turkish bazaar. You can go into a mosque and learn about Islam from a Muslim. I remember the first time I went to uh, Mostar, I got in a bus in Dubrovnik, and two hours later I was in Mostar, and, and here's, uh, this was years ago, this is the first Muslim person I could ever remember talking to about their faith. And she took me into a mosque and told me about all of the symbolism and what it meant to her. Uh, that's amazing. You're two hours from the tourist hordes of Dubrovnik, and you're having that kind of an experience. Uh, a lot of people do go just for a day trip from Dubrovnik. I really recommend spending at least one night in Mostar. It's really well worthwhile, and it's about half as expensive as Dubrovnik. Hotels and restaurants are much cheaper. If you're a little bit more adventurous, I highly, highly recommend continuing a couple hours deeper into Bosnia to the capital of Sarajevo. I've added this to my guidebook the last few years, and it's the site of some of my most meaningful experiences traveling in this part of Europe. Uh, it's not a beginner's sort of thing. It's an intermediate or advanced thing. But if you're fascinated by what I've told you so far and you want to take off those training wheels, uh, Mostar is the place to do it. It's a big, uh, sorry, Sarajevo is the place to do it. It's a big thriving city with lots of mosques and cafe culture and uh, a complicated story, lots of war damage. Hillsides up above Sarajevo that are just, used to be delightful tree-filled parks and now they're just covered with the graves of people who were killed during the siege of Sarajevo during the war. Uh, one of the most powerful, I think, cities to visit in Europe. Not for everybody, but if you're in the area, consider extending your, your little trip into Bosnia a little bit further. Down south of Dubrovnik is another great place to consider, another great day trip from Dubrovnik. You could see the best part of the country of Montenegro in an easy one-day side trip from Dubrovnik. Um, from about, uh, if you leave in the morning from Dubrovnik, in about an hour and a half you're at the border. 
and then you're going around this spectacular Bay of Kotor. It's actually a fjord. It's a Norwegian-style fjord down in the Adriatic. There's a road that goes in and out all of these inlets. You get to stop in the little town of Kotor, which is a, a very charming little town that's huddled under a mountain. You can climb up the fortifications above Kotor and have a view over the spectacular scenery. Um, this is also a very different culture. This is a, a Montenegrins, but it has a lot of ties to the Serbs, so this is more of an Orthodox culture. Dubrovnik, Catholic, Croat culture, all of Croatia, really. Um, Bosnia, you've got the Muslim culture, and then here in Montenegro, you have the Orthodox Serb culture, all within a few hours' drive of uh, Dubrovnik. A very powerful chance to learn about a lot of different things. Uh, it's also, as you can see, absolutely breathtakingly dramatic scenery. I always say, as spectacular and beautiful as the Croatian coastline is, the Bay of Kotor is kind of the encore, uh, and it gives you even more, even better. Uh, we're going to finish up our trip through this region in Slovenia. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think little Slovenia at the northern tip of the former Yugoslavia is probably the most underrated and one of the most delightful countries in Europe. You might not have thought you were going to Slovenia when you showed up and started watching this talk, but I hope in about 10 minutes you'll decide that you have to go to Slovenia because it's a really wonderful place. Tiny little country, about the size of New Jersey, 2 million people, but in that tiny area there's so much to see and do. One thing I love about Slovenia, first of all, it's incredibly scenic. The Alpine Mountains in the northwest are just breathtaking. It's also at the intersection of cultures. You've got Austria in the north, you've got Italy in the west, you've got Croatia in the east and the south. This is where those three great cultures, Germanic culture, Italian culture, and Slavic Croatian culture kind of come together and mingle, and it always seems to me that Slovenia decided to keep only the best bits of each of those cultures. Another thing, again, that people are, I think, surprised by, Slovenia is very surprising um, how delightful it is. People are surprised at how beautiful it is. You might think, again, Slovenia used to be part of Yugoslavia, rusting factories, Yugos. Then you go to Slovenia and you see it's every bit as beautiful as Austria or Switzerland. Just breathtaking mountain panoramas. Let's start in the capital city, right in the middle of the country, Ljubljana. Ljubljana, I think, is the most delightful small city uh, in Europe, I would say. It's a great place just to relax and enjoy. There's some great museums, but it's really mostly about ambiance. It's the kind of place where people seem to be out on a Sunday stroll any day of the week. Um, each one of these countries has its own uh, local heroes. Here on the main square of uh, Slovenia and Ljubljana, you'll learn about uh, Franca Prešeren. He was the national romantic poet of Slovenia, um, and he's sort of their cultural standard bearer. Uh, I love learning about these names, Prešeren, that I've never heard before, and hearing how important he is to the local people. It's a very charming kind of old world town. There's lots of cobbles, lots of old Baroque churches, uh, lots of pedestrian zones. There's a mayor the last few years who's on a crusade to pedestrianize every inch of the town center, and he's had a lot of success. Delightful riverfront embankments, and uh, my favorite people watching anywhere in Europe is on these cafe embankments overlooking the river. You can just camp out for hours and watch people go by. The university campus is just a couple of blocks away from here, so it's just packed with young, stylishly dressed Slovenes who speak perfect English. Um, it's just got a real creative spirit. Uh, Ljubljana is often compared to Salzburg because you've got a castle on a mountain surrounded by a river at the base, and you've got alpine peaks in the distance. And I think that's a, a pretty good comparison. You can head up to the castle. There's some fun little museums and nice viewpoints. Um, I just love exploring the streets of Ljubljana. Um, the mascot of the city is the dragon, so you'll see that symbol all over the place. Uh, but also, it's got wonderful architecture. Uh, the city was damaged by an earthquake in 1895, so they rebuilt in the styles that were popular in Vienna, which was the capital at the time. Sort of Art Nouveau, uh, sort of historicist styles. Even if you don't know anything about architecture, it's a delight just to stroll the streets of Ljubljana and look at the beautiful buildings. This one is a, a, an architect in the early 20th century who tried to uh, come up with a uh, unique Slovenian national style. And maybe it's a good thing this one didn't quite catch on, but it, it was a valiant try. The main name in Slovenia uh, for architecture is Joža Plečnik. He worked in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, he trained in Vienna and gained fame throughout Europe, came back to his hometown, and he basically lived in the city, walked through the main part of town every day on his way to work, and he wanted to design a city that would be livable because he had to live with it. So what he created was kind of like feng shui on a, a grand urban scale. Uh, he designed uh, bridges like this one, embankments. This is the market hall that overlooks the river. It's very eye-pleasing, kind of a clean, modern, meets uh, classical sort of style. 
Uh, lots of symbolism in his works. This is the National University Library. And the symbolism here is all about overcoming uh, barriers for the attainment of knowledge, of enlightenment. So for example, here's Moses who led his people through 40 years of hardship to the promised land. In this case, the promised land being knowledge. When you walk in the door, you take hold of a, a doorknob that's shaped like Pegasus, the winged horse that whisks you off to high levels of enlightenment. Then there's one last challenge as you walk up through the hallway. You have to go through what feels like an Egyptian tomb. It's the last kind of dark challenge. I don't have a picture because they're not allowed, but you open the door at the top, and it's this bright, beautiful, light-filled room that's just crammed with students uh, studying and reading and sucking up information. Uh, really a wonderful example of Joja Plechnik's style. That's a name you've probably never heard before, but if you're in Ljubljana, you'll hear it again and again. A few day trips from Ljubljana just to the south. You've got a wonderful area uh, with some of the best cave systems anywhere on the planet called the Karst. There's a couple uh, that are worth considering, Shkotsian and Postoina. These are described in our guidebook. But basically, it's a chance to see some really dramatic underground formations, rock formations. Uh, you go on a guided tour at either of these caves and get to see some really amazing formations and gigantic caverns until you emerge like animals coming from a cave and, and squint as you come back into the daylight. Uh, some of the best caves anywhere. If you're a horse lover, you, uh, you know about the Lipitzaner Stallions. These are the performing horses uh, for, the, for the Vienna uh, Spanish Riding School. The Lipisaner Stallions uh, actually were bred here in Slovenia, and the stud farm is still open for visitors, uh, even though Austria keeps its own now. Uh, this is where they originated, and you can learn all about that there. And then there's dramatic sites like this Castle Prejama, which is burrowed into the side of a cliff. Um, my favorite thing, I think, uh, much as I love Ljubljana, my favorite place to relax, I guess, in Slovenia is Lake Bled. This is the leading mountain resort of Slovenia. It's a lake, it uh, takes about an hour, hour and a half to walk around it. If you're here in Seattle, it's, it's about the size of Green Lake, uh, just to give you a sense of scale. It's an absolutely beautiful and idyllic place. There's a little island in the middle of the lake. There's a church on top of the island. You ride out to the island on a Pletna boat. This is a unique type of boat you find only here. The way for making this boat, the method is passed down uh, generation by generation from father to son. So you hire a, a boatman to oar you out to the island you end up at the base of a very long flight of 99 stairs. Uh, this is a very popular place for weddings. And the tradition is, after the wedding, the groom is supposed to come here and carry, or try to carry, his bride up all 99 steps, thereby proving himself fit for marriage. Tourists can't risk, uh, resist uh, trying this themselves. Then you go to the top of the island, there's this church, you go in, you ring a bell, you make a wish, it's just perfection. You can also walk on the path all the way around the lake, enjoying the ever-changing views, a really dramatic place. Every time I go, it looks completely different, depending on the light, whether the leaves are changing, whether it's raining, whether it's sunny. You can go up to the castle that overlooks the lake. You can go for a swim. This is uh, crystal clear mountain water. Enjoy some of the cream cakes, this is one of the specialties of Lake Blood. They're very proud of their cream cakes. Um, and also, uh, it's a great home base for heading into the Slovenian mountainsides. It's great uh, to go up into the mountains from here. Uh, this is, as you've seen from these pictures, one of the most beautiful mountain ranges you'll find anywhere. There's a lot of fun little mountain culture hiding out here as well. Slovenia has this very unique form of hay rack. Uh, the hay rack has a roof on it because it's very rainy. So they hang their uh, hay to dry, and they have a little roof to prevent it from getting soaked in the rain. Another bit of folk art uh, are these beehive panels. Uh, Slovenia is a big beehive beekeeping center. Um, basically, the beekeepers believe that if you draw a little scene on the panel, it'll help the bee find its way back. So there's this folk art that emerged for hundreds of years where beekeepers paint these clever, whimsical, sometimes religious, sometimes historical scenes. Some of them are not quite PC. This is the, the devil sharpening the woman's tongue. Um, you know those 19th century Slovenian beekeepers. There's a great little museum of these that's just near Lake Bled, and it's also uh, a great souvenir. They make replicas that you can buy and take home. The best day, though, spent in the Slovenian mountains is to go up and over the Vršić Pass, dramatic mountain pass. It's a road with 50 switchbacks, 24 on the way up, 26 on the way back down. And you're surrounded the entire time by great scenery. Interesting sights. There's a little uh, Russian Orthodox church made of wood. That's because this was built by Russian prisoners of war during World War I. Uh, there was an avalanche here, and it killed several of the Russian workers, so they built a little chapel. Uh, you summit at the top of the pass, come down the other side through this beautiful Socha River Valley, 
uh, crystal clear, I mean absolutely crystal clear water. The Socha Valley, uh, in addition to having these beautiful rivers and springy suspension bridges, where you can get out and go for a little bit of a hop, is also known among historians as the site of some of the fiercest fighting in World War I, not World War II, World War I. This was called the Socha Front, sometimes called by its Italian name, the Isonzo Front. Uh, this was some of the worst fighting in the history of warfare, partly because it took place not down in the valley, but up on the mountaintops. They were fighting each other for control of the valley, but they were doing it in terrible conditions with soldiers imported from all corners of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And there's some really sobering sights that you can see. For example, there's a mausoleum um, where you can see where 7,000 Italian soldiers who were killed are now buried, um, speckled between this mountain grandeur. Uh, it's an amazing contrast between the history of the Socha Valley and just some breathtaking mountain scenery. One of my favorite days that I sp spend doing anything in Europe is, is driving up and over this valley. One more stop in Slovenia. Slovenia has its own tiny little coastline, 29 miles, and the best town there is a beautiful little beach town called Piran. It's very similar to Korčula or Hvar, uh, which we talked about earlier, but like everything in Slovenia, it's a little bit tidier, a little bit quainter, a little bit friendlier. It's got a gorgeous main square, a great promenade where you can go for a swim, and some of the best sunsets you're going to see anywhere. Folks, I hope you've really enjoyed this, and I hope you have a wonderful trip to Slovenia, Croatia, and the rest of the former Yugoslavia. Thank you very much. Thank you.